Hi everybody, um, welcome National Library of New Zealand. Um, I'm Steve Knight, Program Director for the Digital Preservation Program here at the Library. Um, basically what that means is that it's our job to, to think about kind of how we carry digital stuff 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, etc, etc, into the future in a way that's actually kind of meaningful, meaningful and, and real to future historians, researchers, etc, etc. Um, we have stuff in our collections going back 4,000 years sort of Sumerian cuneiform. We have um, over 20,000 objects in our rare books collections. Going back to 1469, we have one of the, the largest and best Milton collections in the world. And we're pretty good at doing our job in that space. We also have coming up towards two million objects in our digital collections, and that could be a single image, a piece of text, an audio-visual file, or it could be a 10,000-page website. So what we call an object has that kind of varying um, nature to it. Um, what we can't say is that we're actually that sure about what we're doing with that stuff and whether or not we can actually carry it forwards and ensure its authenticity and integrity in the future. So that's it for me. Um, I'd just like to introduce you to Adrian Kingston. Adrian's uh, digital officers, digital office lead. <laughs> oh, digital operations lead at um, Te Papa, and he's going to take us through today's sessions. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, yes, hi. Also, I am a digital operations league at a league lead <laughs> at Te Papa. Thinking of gaming already. <laughs> um, uh, but I've spent a lot of time um, working with digital collecting and digital preservation and I've also worked uh, quite closely with the team here and stuff, So, um, and I do play games. Um, so the overview of the structure today is um, we're going to play a vodcast from um, some commentators in Australia and then Chris is going to respond with his own interpretation of the subject. And so as Deep mentioned, we're talking about uh, video games and how they affect our lifestyles and of course collecting and preservation of that kind of whatever it is. Um, so we are going to start with the vodcast, which is by Stephen O'Donnell and Stephanie Bindinson, Bindixon, uh, Australia's best known video game critics, uh, writing and presenting ABC's, ABC TV's Good Game and its companion shows Good Game Spawn Point and Good Game Pocket Edition. And I will mention, I have put a lure out on the Cathedral Pokestop, <laughs> if anybody is, um, you know, bored with this and wants to just collect some Pokemon. Hi, I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. And we host a show on the ABC called Good Game, which is a video game review show. Yes, we are video game critics, and today's theme is play, and we love to play games. Yeah, we really do. <laughs> games are a really exciting medium that we've really loved and been passionate about for a long time, and they are really an art form. It's a very lucky time for us to be playing games, too, because they've gone from this like 2D, simple, square-shaped kind of experience to these big 3D realistic photorealistic branching, branching storyline <laughs> emotive uh, epic adventures. Yeah, I think not a lot of people are aware that there's some really interesting and exciting things happening with narrative in video games and the way story is explored and the element of player interactivity within that is really exciting. Yeah, you know, as humans we love to tell stories. I think that's a big part of human history since we, you know, climbed out of the sea and video games are just another way to do that, but they can do it in really complicated and interesting and technical and visually stunning ways. Yeah, yeah. but then involving things like, um, you know, competitiveness and um, puzzle solving, cooperation, all of that kind of stuff as well, which is really exciting. And video games really are art. You know, I'm not afraid to admit, Hex, that I have cried at least twice this year because oh, of things that have happened in games. Me too. Yeah, they <laughs> really pull at the heartstrings. And yeah, you're right, and a lot of people really consider games as an art form or something that is worthy of preservation, but they absolutely are. Games are part of our history, and it's really important to preserve them as well, just like anything historical. And digital preservation is something that's kind of tricky. It's you know, we recently went to um, an exhibition in a museum that had a whole bunch of old arcade games and I remember seeing um, 
a father taking his his kid uh, and saying, oh, yeah, this is a game called Asteroids, and I used to play this when I was a kid. And <laughs> he was trying to teach his son how to play this game, and yeah. his son was like, largely unimpressed with the whole thing because it was just unlike anything he'd ever played before. And I thought, you know, that's it's so important to be able to let people know that this is the evolution of games, and this is where games started and where they came from. Yeah, you know, games are a big part of our world now, you know, and I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we need to kind of mark those points, those turning points in, in video game evolution and in technology evolution and kind of capture those experiences. You know, like you say, playing asteroids, that's something that is going to be hard to capture in a hundred years from now. Yeah. How do we do it? And what about online games? You know, mm. like the online experiences we're having now where we're creating worlds in like Minecraft or, or silly games like Reign of Kings, which I personally love a lot because it's got all this role playing stuff in it. We're building mm. castles and knocking them down. That's an experience that sits in an online space. And that online space won't be there one day when that game eventually loses yeah. popularity and they can't sustain the servers. Something like World of Warcraft will end <laughs> One day, probably. And where's that world going to go? That world is going to be dis disappearing. And there are also many <laughs> stories, you know, not just stories within the actual game world, but stories that players have created. And yeah. we'd, I'd love to, to think that at least some of those stories would be able to be protected and, and preserved. We're starting to see a big resurgence in retro games because it's almost like games have evolved to a point where they explain too much to you or they hold your hand a little bit too much and experiences are becoming very accessible and taking advantage of all the various different aspects of technology but there is something about that original core experience of just trying to hit a target or you know um, just that based on the pure reflex and I think it's really important to kind of preserve the um, starting point of games to be able to reference you know, every modern design experience as well. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of that experience is down to the technology of the time. Mm. And that technology is dying, you know? Like, uh, trying to find a working computer from the 80s, it's good luck. It's a challenge. The reason why <laughs> Super Mario has a moustache is because they didn't have enough pixels to be able to create a full face for him. Mm. So they were like, well, just give him a moustache and you'll kind of get <laughs> a sense of who he is. I think that's so great, you know, yeah. it's not a problem we face now, but I love that that was a challenge for them back then. What I love about Games Hex is that every year they kind of reinvent themselves and we get new genres. We're still creating genres in games. And, you know, when I think back in the day, I would look at the back of the box and see like a dragon and a guy and a castle, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and all these people. And then you'd look at the game and it would just be a red dot. Okay, that's the dragon. <laughs> That's, that square there is this guy, and that square there is that guy. Your imagination really had to fill in the blanks. It did have to fill in the blanks. <laughs> yeah. And we could never have imagined what games would look like as they do now. Like the way they look now, this, I never would have thought they would have looked this good. So what is it going to be like it's in so 100 years? It's so hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah. We just can't predict what it's going to become based on what it has been. And that's so exciting. Kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, the, my job... In, all the jobs I've had really have um, revolved around computers. But the way that I got into computers was actually through games. So the way I want to respond to Bejo and Hex's video is actually to talk you through some of my own history with games and then to pose what I think is, I personally think is probably the biggest challenge in digital preservation around games, which sort of comes out of quite a few of the things which they were talking about. So I, I grew up playing games. Um, the first, uh, the first way that I really encountered games outside of the arcades in my, in my home was with an Atari 2600. And they, they talked about asteroids, and I have such fond memories of asteroids. This isn't actually the Atari 2600 version, it's a different version. Um, but my brother and I just played so much of this, of this really, really simple little game of being a spaceship and shooting down asteroids and, and also having this other little flying saucer. We also played a lot of Defender. My brother was amazing at Defender, incredible. Um, and Battlezone. And, and Battlezone was remarkable because it sort of highlights one of the things that I really like about games. You were, you were a, a tank and there were these strange shapes that you'd shoot at, but there were these mountains and we eventually realized that you couldn't reach the mountains. They were just sort of <laughs> background, but we had all of these stories about what was in the mountains and if you could reach there, what would there be there? And I think that that to me is one of the really important things about, about games is, is their, um, the way that they sometimes can, can really kind of promote um, imaginative thinking. Then the first real computer that I encountered was a BBC Micro, and that was actually at, at primary school. Um, so we didn't have one in the house, and, but we used to um, stay after school and, and play in lunch times and play games like Repton. 
and especially Elite. And it's amazing to see Elite remade um, in, in the last few years. Um, but Elite was just, it blew my mind and I can talk about why if, if anyone wants to pick that up. We then had, um, but I'm conscious that I've only got 10 to 15 minutes and I got 38 slides. So we also had an Amstrad um, CPC 6128. This was the first um, computer that we actually had in our house. Our friends had Commodore 64s and we would go over there and play on the Commodore. Um, my brother and I played a lot of Jet Set Willy 2 and a lot of a game called Thanatos, which I've never met anyone else who played, but it was, oh, it's really good. It's so great. And then we eventually had an Amiga 500, sort of around high school, maybe a little bit younger than that, actually. Um, and I think this is where my, I, I eventually went on to become a geographer and study cartography and work as a cartographer. Um, and I think this is where my love of maps came from games like Populous. Um, also, Loom was a, was a really incredible special game to us. Uh, and, and the game Pirates, which was about, <laughs> it's so nice to see people nodding their heads <laughs> in the audience, um, about s sailing around um, uh, the West Indies and, and uh, navigation and plundering and trade. And it, it was an incredible game. <laughs> but all these games, and, and I think this was a, a, a theme that ran through that video, is these, these games are really quite particular to the time. Um, they're not. I don't think they're timeless in the sense that something like chess or, or, or Go is, um, which are so highly abstracted that it's really just about a set of rules. And, and I think that I expect that those games will, will live for forever almost. Um, but these games, I think um, they're really specific to a particular time and a particular set of technological expectations. So I'm amazed by efforts like the Internet Archive in particular, um, but other efforts as well around the world of, of trying to preserve the games. And I think it's a really valuable thing. This is actually, I was on, um, I went to the, way, uh, to the Internet Archive last night. I loaded up P Prince of Persia. I started playing Prince of Persia. Um, I actually, the reason I was falling down this hole was because I was trying to screenshot at the same time. I wanted this <laughs> shot of like effortlessly jumping across the, the pit, um, but I messed it up and then it seemed more fitting that it was actually <laughs> falling down this deep hole. Um, and even when I go back, it's, it's actually not particularly satisfying. It's, it's nice for a moment to, to remember and sort of almost to touch history, um, but the actual enjoyment of playing the game, it, it's quite, quite different. There's a podcast, there's a few podcasts that I listen to, um, about three podcasts actually, which, which are to do with games of the sort of, I don't know, 11 or so podcasts that I sort of try and listen to in a, over the course of a month. Um, and one of them is, is quite interesting. It's Cool Ghosts and they're these two guys, Matt Lees and, and Quentin Smith. They're in their late 20s and they, they talk about games, but from a really interesting, in my opinion, perspective, often some of the, um, both the sort of personal takes on games, but also some of the societal implications and uh, cultural context of them, and they have all sorts of smart guests. And so they're, I think, about 28, 29, so they're sort of a, about 10 years younger than me, and um, so they sort of grew up behind where I was with games, and they talked about encountering some of the games that I've just shown you, and just not, like, being mildly curious about them, but actually having no... <laughs> no sort of emotional response whatsoever and just sort of seeing them as these curiosities and I, and I was actually quite glad to hear them speaking so frankly because often I'll see retrospective articles talking about games and, and how amazing they are written by someone in the early 20s and I just think no, it's, it, I, I, are you really having this reaction or is this just what you expect to think and so what they talked about a lot was um, I, they, they, they're, they're really smart they talked about though the one time that they really got games was when they actually went to an arcade which had been set up. So an old games arcade with arcade machines. And they encountered it kind of on its own terms where there was late 70s, early 80s music playing. It was, um, there were people smoking, there was um, spilt drinks and it was actually much more authentic kind of experience. Um, so this is how I remember games when I think about it this is how I remember them but then this is what they were actually like just these little blocks of, of, of pixels but I actually think it's really important that that the so much of the efforts around digital preservation and, and this is admirable and this is I think has to be the case have been on preserving the actual games themselves and I sort of see that as a baseline we have just going to find a way to make sure that the game will run um, either on original 
uh, technology or, or more likely on some sort of emulated technology. But this is actually much more to me what what games are is actually the act of play and I think that that's a real challenge for um, preservation is actually trying to find some way to, to actually conserve or hint at all of the stuff that went around the actual bit of software. Um, I recently watched, this was a Children of the Dog Star, which was a, a, a kid old show in the um, mid-1980s. Um, it's up on New Zealand on screen. It, it, this had a really big impact on me. It was a, um, I, re I read the novelization when I was um, around at the same time on a summer holiday. I just really remember it, and I particularly remember this kid, um, I think the character's name's Ronnie, who just spent a lot of the a lot of the first few episodes of the show playing games and it was such a delight to go back and it kind of reminded me of um, what it was actually like to, to play these things and it was much more about the than the the actual software itself it was also about the context about being in a dairy and having a, a, a line of kids behind you watching you either you kind of really doing well or completely messing up and so then going through the Turnbull's collections and seeing some of the incredible stuff that they've collected from the Evening Post in particular um, and the um, Dominion newspaper and just getting a sense of what these, um, for me, remembering what these arcades were like and then some kids down at the Wellington Ferry Terminal. And I love these two girls who are hanging off the back of the machine, kind of like peering over the top. And so this to me is actually a huge part around the preservation of, of play and games. It's more than just the software, it's actually about trying to also find ways of capturing that, that cultural and social context that the games are played within. Um, and this is just a yet another one. Uh, this is not my own map, although we made many maps like this, and I'm so upset that we don't have photographs of these things, I, like I really wish I'd kept them. But this is a map of a game, Colossal Cave. Um, it's a 1979 game. It was also known as Adventure. It's a very, it was probably the first major text adventure, interactive fiction that was ever made. So it was all like you really just typed into a console, go north, pick up keys, open door, and so on. But people made these maps, and kids made these maps, and we made these maps. And I think that they're, they actually, this I think gives a much better idea of what the appeal of the game Colossal Caves was than the actual sitting at somebody down and, and playing through the text prompt. Um, so I thought I'd just like finish off by, by talking, one of these things that's happening right now, so that's why I've been talking about Pokemon Go and showing like this Pokemon um, on social media and showing the, um, the, that little kind of Pokemon video at the start, is that there is this phenomena going on which is P Pokemon Go and it seems to be kind of as probably expected sort of like tailing off now but there was a week or two there where it was just sort of <laughs> everywhere it was almost impossible to avoid but I think that the game itself is actually probably the least interesting thing about Pokemon Go um, and I actually think that the game is almost impossible to probably preserve because it's um, and this is an increasing trend and it was hinted at in the in the Australian video is that it's actually only a small part of the game is actually on your phone. A lot of it is actually being um, served up on a server somewhere in um, the United States or Japan where um, most of the game is actually happening and it's just sending you data. Um, so Pokemon Go, for, for folk who may not have actually played it, is it's a really interesting game in that it's, um, uh, it's not the first of its kind, but it's the first one that's really kind of got this sort of level of popularity. It's a game that's played on your phone, it hooks into your real world location using the GPS that you're at, and superimposed upon the world around you are these little um, places where you can find these these strange creatures called, called Pokemon. And you hold your phone up and it will actually, um, when you uh, near one, it will show the Pokemon on top of the uh, Adrian can probably give a demonstration of this. Um, on top of the, <laughs> on, on top of the real world that you're seeing through the camera, this sort of augmented reality, and you can catch these things and build up these. I don't know libraries of Pokemon. I, I don't think it's a very interesting game, but a lot of people are, are really, really into it, and um, and it's actually the phenomena around it which I think is fascinating. So I started collecting tweets about Pokemon over the last little while. Um, 
the, this was one of the first ones that appeared. I don't actually know whether this is legitimate or not. The, the, all of the rest I can actually vouch for are, are, are genuine. But this one I just thought was so hilarious. And I think it was on the very first day that it got released. Um, just someone putting up this sign because... Um, and I've heard from people who work in cafes where there is a pokey stop that people were coming in, not buying anything, and um, uh, but, but just staying there catching Pokemon and then leaving. Um, but this sort of, um, there were all these newspaper articles about this. Um, yeah. And it was remarkable to walk around uh, the around Lower Queen Street in Auckland and around um, the ferry terminal and um, uh, High Street at night and just see all these people on that fir those first couple of weekends. <laughs> like, you, you'd see people with their phone out but not touching it. And just kind of, and, and it's like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and it was, um, and then kind of catch a glimpse and, and just of all different ages. And it was, it was phenomenal. Um, again, literally, so this is a, a Wellington based photograph. Literally everyone in this photo is playing Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this was, became quite a famous case. This is out on the, um, on the harbour in Wellington, which it was picked up by international news. Um, these people going out to, um, uh, collect po Pokemon in, in kayaks and, and canoes from, from the fountain because there happened to be a Pokestop out there. Um, Adrian, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is some stuff from Adrian. So this, is, well, so this is a strategy meeting that uh, Te Papa and had, one of many, many museums around the world to discuss what their Pokemon Go strategy was going to be. And perhaps we can ask Adrian a little bit for, for some details. Similar with um, uh, Museum in Toronto. Um, so that I think that there is sort of like leaves me with a couple of questions is, the first thing is just, so what is, it in, what is actually interesting about the Pokemon Go phenomena? Um, what is it that is of interest? Because I don't think it's the software. I think it's actually the acts of play that go around that. Um, and if that's the case, what is it that we actually collect? If, if we are going to collect things and try to preserve them, what is it about Pokemon Go or about other games that we should actually focus our attentions on? So that was my response to the video, and I think Adrian's going to now lead a discussion. I've got a few things to add. Great. Right. Excellent. Um, I'll leave that EV there. Hopefully it doesn't run away. Um, there was just a couple of things, and I can tell you what we did with um, Pokemon. So the main thing was, again, not the game, but the cultural response and what was happening in the building. So we had our, our hosts were a bit concerned about some of the... We had uh, four Pokestops in the building and a whole number around. There's a whole lot all the way down the waterfront. So we had people coming in um, with their phones, as Chris described, and just sort of standing there and doing strange things, walking around the building. Um, and so the, the hosts didn't really understand. So what we did was, the first thing we decided was we needed to brief the hosts, tell them that it's cool, that we, we're quite welcoming of this. It's, you know, people can come and didn't do anything they want, really. Um, th that's what the museum is for. But there was one Pokestop in particular that's a Māori carving. And we don't really allow photography of that. And one of the things that you can do is, um, is you can take a screenshot of the Pokemon and its environs so you can see it in the real world. And so people weren't actually meaning to take a photograph of the thing, but they were inadvertently taking a photograph of Tonga in a way that wasn't necessarily strictly in line with how we usually allow that kind of thing. Um, so that was, that's one place where we educated the host just in terms of how to communicate that that's, this is a special area and blah, blah, blah. So, and then the hosts were very comfortable. The other thing we did do, of course, is there always has to be some kind of marketing response when something like this happens. Um, so we had some discussions around trying to sort of get rid of some of the more stupid ideas. Um, and it's a really interesting thing about how you, are we just jumping on the bandwagon? And um, it was decided at the end, yes, blatantly we, we are. Um, so what we did was we said, um, so we're in the we're in the business of collecting um, specimens as well. So it's a lot like what Pokemon is. So we encourage people to um, share their best uh, collection of us of a Pokemon into Papa, a photograph of it, and two winners got a tour, a special tour of the. Um, the wet fish collection and, and see all the weird specimens and stuff that we had, which went down pretty well without being too cheesy. Um, so we, we found a, a sort of deal with the physical and then the how can we sort of leverage the popularity of it. One thing I was going to say, so it, it has been mentioned um, that there is some parallels. Well, they were saying that um, games are art and there's been a big discussion around this. You know, some gamers don't want it to be seen as an art form, others do. Um, 
I'm not going to argue that one way or the other, but what there is a lot of parallel with is collecting art. Um, there's a lot of born digital art and in, in installations that there's a lot of these kind of questions that what is it that you need to collect over, or, and manage over the long term so that the artwork is still around and still representing what it was before. When the um, plasma screen that we bought from the artist is no longer available, that technology, when the file formats that are powering the screen are no longer available, it's that kind of thing. It's like, it's what's the experience of the artwork? And that's what a lot of the, um, what Chris was talking about with the gaming as well. What's surrounding it? What's the interaction? What's the message? Um, what's the frustration? Um, and then I was, there was something else. Um, but yeah, I, and okay, so then I had one other thing that's, that came to mind. So we'll, there has been a smartphone um, thing that's almost been as popular, and that was Angry Birds. But that was pretty much as, that was a straightforward on your, um, on your phone game. But there was a whole culture that sprang up around it, and it was something that made games much more mainstream. And there's the idea of games not really being games anymore. It's just something that people do. Um, so a lot of people who don't call themselves gamers actually play quite a lot of games. Um, and so there's another one that's a little bit like uh, the Pokemon, and it's, it's pretty underground still, but it is called um, Zombie Run. And it's actually a running app that instead of just tracking what you do, yep. you're running away from zombies. Um, and it's, it's directing you where you should go. It's audio. Yeah, audio. Um, and so you're running and it's telling, you, it's, it's telling you they're behind you, you need to go a bit faster and all of that kind of thing. And so it's again combined, and that's a game, but they wouldn't think of themselves as gamers. It's just a different way of getting motivation for running. So I think actually it's kind of tied to the idea of what we talked about yesterday as well, it's not creating, uh, sort of preserving so much the individual artifacts, which we've talked a lot about today, but it is the, what's the overall, and instead of saying this, this is a game and therefore this is how we're going to collect it, what's the process for collecting digital culture and the things that spring out yeah. of these artifacts? I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, so anyway, um, I'll grab the other. Oh, I've got it just here. Does anyone else have anything to add? <laughs> You, you, you've missed a very big category of game, I think, which is, uh, and, and, and calling it a game is questionable, Farmville, which is probably one of the biggest breakthrough cross-platform yeah. games as well. Um, but it represents, it's not really a game. Mm. There's nothing gaming in about it other than the gamification of mm. mundane tasks plus um, leveraging dollar from somebody's wallet to buy stupid trinkets, he says with an opinion. Um, and there's a little bit, uh, there's some interesting stuff around uh, where we got to with Pokemon as well. So Pokemon has actually been about a 15 year journey and really the idea of the Pokemon game was only, I, as far as I know, it came up in the last year or so that Pokemon was actually involved. Um, so there was a whole lot of, so it's created by a lab that's um, owned by Google. Um, and it's based off Google Maps and your Google accounts and everything like that. And so one of the actual things that's... Just talking about ingress, you have, like, you have to talk about ingress. Yes, that's yeah. what I'm going to say, yeah. Um, so uh, just to, to clarify, um, it's no longer owned by Google, but it, it's spun out of Google. Um, it's a separate company called um, Niantic. Um, and they created a game about four years ago called Ingress. And that was very much a, a very similar kind of thing, but it was a science fiction kind of thing where there are two teams, the Enlightened and the Resistance. The Enlightened are trying to, essentially you're trying to take over and protect parts of the um, world. And it's all, it's, it's um, augmented reality. It's very much, you have to walk around the city just like Pokemon is. The, um, but all of the main points of interest were um, collected by the players. So um, it might be that National Library is a point of interest. And so you could tell, ask Google to make that um, an ingress portal. And to Papa is one, and there'll be a statue somewhere else, and all these things. And these portals were the things that you fought for, and you tried to connect as a team. Well, that is a data gathering exercise for Google. Um, all of the geolocation movement that all of these players were doing is data gathering for Google. Um, and then what has happened with, that kind of was, it was a really reasonably underground game, um, reasonably sort of uh, passionate group of, but they were g genuine gamers. Uh, and when, when Adrian says uh, underground, it, it's important to remember the scale of these things. So underground was about five million people. Yeah, um, it's around a, it's the world. It's a significant it's, population. It's a global game. Um, so what then they decided to do to make it, okay, that was a lot of groundwork and a lot of experimentation and it's like that was pretty successful, you could say that. Then they grabbed Pokemon 
laid it on top, all the Pokestops are the portals that were provided by all of the, uh, the Ingress gamers. So that they had spent three years being able to build up this game, overlay a brand, and some really good gameplay, and I disagree, I think it's actually a very fun game to play. <laughs> um, and, and immediately have the success, which makes it mainstream, um, and makes it kind of no longer a game anymore. It's kind of like, it's just a thing to do. Um, so I can't remember where I was going with that, but it is, it's like, it's the thing about Farmville, it's like the monetization of something mundane and, and tying into an audience that's already there and just gamifying something. The, there can be other motivations around some of these more societal um, sort of games, um, and so Google was a big one. What do you say a thing to do means it's not a game? Why do I say it's a thing to do and not a game? Um, well, I, I, I guess I question what, what is a what, what makes it a game and why do we put it in that box different from watching a movie or, um, or the, all, all the stuff that surrounds it, like drawing your maps. Um, one of the other things I really remember that what it reminded me of was the walkthroughs, all mm -hmm. written in ASCII, um, you know, by some really dedicated player who went through as fast as they could, became the expert, the go-to person, posted that on the net and everybody went to it and it was amazing. And that's the kind of stuff that we, you know, and there's the, the stuff that comes out of the games and the stuff that goes into the games. Um, maybe we need to document the process rather than the output. Um, or maybe we need to video the playing of the game and go, see how it worked? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the definitions around games are really interesting in that it's, it's in, in, a, in a funny way, a bit like art, where it's actually an incredibly difficult... In fact, it's one of the examples that's used even back in the early 20th century by, by Wittgenstein around category theory of an example of something that's almost impossible to define. Because um, at the time he was writing, it was like, so you've got tennis and chess and hopscotch and ring around the rosy and hide and seek. And what's the... Each one of these, you, you try and find something which is in common. It's like, okay, a game's something that you can win, except hopscotch is, is not really like that, or, or tiddlywinks is sort of like... And, and so in each case, you can find these exceptions where it, it's... Um, in the end, it's like, if it looks like a game and feels like a game, it's a, it's a game. But it's actually... It's, it really is quite an elusive concept. Um, and so, and so, and so, because it's elusive, there's a lot of contestation around what it is and what's a good example of a game and what's something that should be um, preserved. Like, is farm book a game? It, it probably is. But in, in many ways, I, mean, I think I think that the question of art is actually I find it quite interesting. I think that games are sometimes art, um, but more often they're products. Um, you could say that about art as well, though. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's well, totally right. And should we be preserving every product that happens to come onto the market? I, I think the answer is probably no. Um, Just coming back to games and gamification and um, why do we do it and what's there. So there are other things that people treat as games, but definitely aren't. So like being a top reviewer on um, Yelp or something like that, because it is gamified. So it's, mm. but it's not a game, but it's that idea of I win, I'm the best, I'm the best reviewer and, and you know, I'm now seen as an expert, I, I even get stars next to my name. Yesterday in the, in the talk on digital lifestyles, I talked about my favourite game of, of 2016 and that was putting my family tree together on Ancestry.com and that, it was like a game, it was very much like finding clues across these different in, um, national institution uh, archives and libraries within um, Australia, New Zealand, and um, especially England and Scotland, um, unlocking this tree of things, um, uh, leaving little hints, messaging other players. It was, it was like, it felt like a game. It was, it was very curious, but it wasn't a game at all. <laughs> Did you die? Uh, no, but many of, many of my relatives had. Um, Has he got a good ball? <laughs> Kirsty. Um, the military have been using games for a long time. Um, and so it's that, you know, where's the line? It's just a, it's a tool. It's just, it's an experience. Um, obviously, there, there's some more significant winning and losing when you move from the game to the real life. Um, but the other thing I was thinking was, is that any different with computer games? 
uh, you know, we used to use quiz in our rods and all kinds of stuff, not just for the maths, but to actually there were games around them. We used to use card games and all kinds of stuff for learning. So it's just kind of transitioned. It's become more acceptable. I think the role of games in education is really interesting and really warrants quite careful thought. Um, and I'm quite conflicted about it. So. On the downside, there's been some really interesting things around the use of particularly strategy games in history, um, where the students have, uh, games tend, there tends to be sort of what's sometimes called a hidden curriculum to, to games that's not apparent as you're playing it. And it's often there just out of convenience in order to make the programming possible. Um, so there's things that are kind of d difficult things that are abstracted away, but the game has such fidelity that it's treated almost as 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 what what really kind of happened and so i guess it's it's i mean it's similar though to, to critiques around fictional movie or movies which are like based on um true events so something like say saving private ryan or, or something um where the details that are not included are, are somehow crucial to um a, a robust understanding of, of a historical event on the flip side there are some things that there are things that games do that I think no other medium can, and that's why I hold out such hope for it. Even though I'm disappointed with almost everything that game that is released, not that that's overstating it, but I think that there is um, there are a lot of terrible, in my opinion, games that are. I, I don't think the medium has realised its potential, and one of the examples which I was just blown away by was. Um, hearing somebody talk about his experience growing up in Canada and the teacher played a game with them around World War II. And it was actually a game, not a computer game, it was a game in the classroom. And so what they did was it was around, um, uh, it was a game where the students had um, all represented nations in the lead up to World War II. And there was a group of 12 people were France, um, a group of eight were the United Kingdom, one person was Russia, one person was Germany, and each of these people had to um, make decisions about the future of their country as, uh, over a series of turns. And what the students learnt by, by, by playing it was how difficult it was for France and for the UK to actually get their act together and to respond to the events that were coming in. Whereas the German and the Russian players, there was only one person, and they could just go, yep, we'll do this. And um, it was actually through kind of simulating how decision making was made at the very top levels of those nations in the lead up to, to war, the students actually got this quite uh, visceral understanding of, of a, an important aspect of um, international diplomacy. Um, and so I see that a lot of promise in something like that. There's a, um, it reminded me of a movie called After the Dark, which was, um, I, th I think it's based in India, but it's a, essentially a philosophy um, class that's getting together and given a task by their teacher to um, survive a, a nuclear apocalypse in a bunker and they had to make decisions around how to allocate food and who was allowed back in if they went out and all of this kind of stuff and it's kind of that sort of thing it's like what and it was essentially a game in a movie and they got to play the game three or four times and it were all entirely different outcomes and it was I think that's the thing what I was thinking about not being a game there's so much blending now mm. that I think it, it just yeah I think that's kind of what I was getting to with, with um, that I had one thought, just completely off topic, was... <laughs> Not completely off topic, sure. Pong. <laughs> pong, right? How do you preserve Pong? So what is it that's the, um, the, the key thing? This is how we think about artworks. What is the main thing that we need to preserve for someone else to be able to experience to understand the, the essence of that <laughs> thing? And it's like, Pong's pretty simple. You've got two things going up and down, two paddles. You've got a, um, a little pixel ball Absolutely. going backwards and forwards. So that's fairly, you, you don't necessarily need the technology for that. There are some elements around the frustration of missing it when you really should have got to it, but you were limited to a, a particular speed or whatever. Um, I thought, how could you translate Pong into VR and still have exactly the same experience? And I actually think it would be possible because you could have the constraints that you had, but you apply them to your physical body as well. And the frustration is not being able to get to the ball in time. It's quite a simple thing, but you could really turn it into something without needing to preserve it. It's something that I think you could, and you couldn't necessarily do it with others. The other thing I was thinking of was we, um, and how do we preserve all the broken televisions that came from people throwing the controller too hard and not having the, or all the broken controllers from when you know somebody lost it at, at whatever PlayStation and they threw the controller down on the floor or whatever. That is a lot of what the gaming actually is, and it's kind of irrelevant what the game was. And so are we, you know, should we be collecting um, gaming experience and culture 
regardless of the particular title. Mm. It, oh. Um, I, I was going to uh, go along the same lines of the experience being the important thing. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in um, real terms, the, the software that drives a game is, I mean, it's difficult, but it's actually probably easier than everything else that's digital because we're confined to a platform and everything is actually a gem, a generally a, a confined box and so it's easier to emulate and et cetera, et cetera. But the experience is much more difficult. I wouldn't consider myself a gamer, but I have a, actually probably a similar background to Chris and I was looking at, oh, I remember that game, remember that game. Um, <clears throat> and I remember specifically being 20, I would have been like 24, and I was playing one of the many um, Second World War run around shoot people. That was the kind of the genre that I really enjoyed. And I was playing um, D-Day, I was doing a D-Day landing, and I was coming onto the beach, on the beachhead, and I remember actually having to stop the game and go like, it must have been a really, really awful thing. And I've watched a heap of war films before that, I read books, and my brother was obsessed with Vietnam War, and we used to watch those that stuff. But it was only in that moment that I actually really got to even start to think about what it must have been like to be a young man going on a boat to your probably impending doom, mm. and the game is the closest thing that got me as a, as a relatively functional human being into what it must have felt like. It's a thing of you have to get from here to there, right. and now you realise how difficult right. and, it was. And then I died and I started again, yeah. and then I died and I started again, and it's like, oh, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Well. I would have been dead. Huh. And I actually had to put the game down. And the other thing, and, and I've never actually admitted to this out loud, Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Camera's on you. I think of life in the way of a, of a computer game rather than the other way around. So when I have a problem, and if it's a, if it's a software problem or a, or I can't do something problem, I, I, um, I kind of go, oh, I'm not supposed to be at that level yet, and I'm going to go away and grind somewhere else to get me back to a place where I'm at that level. And, and actually, a very weird, and I don't know why I'm telling this story, but I just think it's kind of related. Just in terms of how I experience it, or how games influence my thinking. Um, I, I was in uh, TPT running a meeting earlier today, and there were two AAA batteries that were just on the side thing. And I went, oh, batteries, I'll pick them up put them in my pocket. And we come down here, and uh, Chris is trying to use the, 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 the zapper for the thing, and I'm like, oh, the batteries are right. so cool, I picked them up. And like, it's just for some reason, that kind of game hoarding <laughs> yeah. is a thing. We need that later. And if I had to pick them up at that level, I wouldn't have had the batteries, yeah. I wouldn't be able to solve that bit of the puzzle. You'd have to go back. Right, and it's, I'd be like, oh, where did I see those batteries? <laughs> so it's just, it's a very weird thing. I don't consider myself a gamer, but there is a very influential way of, of how games have permeated into how I solve a problem. And I, and I can't be the only person that thinks like this. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. There's yeah. something in that. And it's that experiential part that I don't know that you can capture. Oh, how do you even get close to capturing how influential it has been for people of our age particularly, and, and maybe younger, I don't know. Mm. But it's such an influential thing in how we think and problem solve. There's, there's, two, thing, there's two questions here, but I'd, qu I'd quickly like to say just two things to that. The first is that I had a flatmate years ago um, it was when the first game, first version of The Sims came out, and he was playing The Sims, and then he'd go to work, and he was often just thinking in terms of levelling up his social interactions or his um, uh, his exercise bar and things like that, and it really got ingrained in him. But I guess more the more salient thing I wanted to say was actually responding to something that Adrian said. Well, I guess that we've all been talking about, and that's about I actually don't think it's necessarily so difficult to preserve some of the culture around games. Um, I think that there, to do it in a really high fidelity way, absolutely, yeah, that, that's really, there's some challenges there. But, so when I've put this photograph into the talk, the reason I had to use another kid was because my parents just never took photographs of us playing games, even though we spent so much time sitting on the lounge floor playing games. But it was just so every day. It was so every day that no one bothered to take a photograph of it, and so there's no record of it. Um, and I guess that that's what I, I don't, th I think there are actually quite simple ways of preserving culture around games. When I looked through the Turnbull archives, there's, there's only a very small number of photographs of, of kids in the 1980s, and I say kids because it's mostly kids um, playing games. There's just a handful, um, and then the rest of it, it, it's, the rest of those experiences are just, they're gone. They're lost, all of that, all of that stuff. And whether or not that's important, I, I don't know. But um, I, don't, I do know that it's, it's not difficult, especially these days, to photograph and, and take video footage um, of, of people who are comfortable sharing these experiences. So I'd just like to note that Chris has said on record that it's not difficult to um, 
record and preserve intangible heritage. No, I didn't say preserve. <laughs> I said photograph and video. The preservation stuff is very difficult, but we're good at that as memory institutions. We're not. We're terrible at it. We're absolutely because this is just one version of ex life experience that that we're not good at focusing on. There's a whole lot of things around mm. it. It's essentially intangible culture. Yeah. And it's not. But what I did think was um, is this example is if you went through a lot of memory institutions or or popular records of gaming, you would think that people only played games on Christmas morning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. Amy's been patiently waiting for... Um, this isn't really about the, the preservation of games, but the gaming of the stuff that we have already preserved, or the stuff that we are good at collecting and preserving, both in our physical collections and our digital collections, picking up on the point of... Um, playing a game as a way of immersing yourself and taking on a perspective that helps you say, now I understand what this experience was like. So uh, things like um, building virtual versions of real historical events and landscapes in Minecraft and that sort of thing. And I was just thinking, I got to the Gallipoli exhibition for the first time last weekend. And for me, it wasn't the giant hyper-realistic statues that really brought things home to me. It was the um, tabletop models that yeah. had um, the movements the of the troops and stuff and yeah. light. And that was something, even though there was, you know, well, it wasn't seeing little people or anything like that, but it really helps you to contextualize history and scale and all those things that that exhibition was aiming to do. Um, so maybe we can think about how games become a mechanism for um, educating and sharing um, mission and what we've been doing for so long with um, kids and adults because we're all really gamers these days. One of the, I think one of the things that is really interesting about games and museums is that games I think is really the only medium from when we think about like uh, photography or compare it to photography or music or um, uh, video which is which is True, interactive by its very nature, where you don't have to force the interactivity in. And interactivity seems to be something that I, seems to work really well in museums for, for guests, although obviously it's, it brings its own difficulties. But um, yeah, I think there's, there's a real potential there. I just wanted to comment on that Gallipoli thing. Um, it's interesting because everybody has different favourites, but that is absolutely mine as well in terms of it's the least glossy, it's, the, it's one of the smaller ones, but it explains the situation in much clearer than a lot of the other things. And it, you just go, wow, there was so much more movement than I realised, and it was so much more backwards and forwards, and it, was, it seems very simple, but just the subtlety of the way that it's done is, is considerably nicer than a lot of the other things, I think, in the exhibition. And Anzac is really being used, or Gallipoli is really being used as, um, it's our, la our latest big exhibition, and we're about to go into refreshing the entire building. Um, all of our, uh, all of these, are, you know, th we're going to learn a lot from those, and I think we've been talking a lot, a lot about what the next um, natural science exhibition is going to be like, and a big bit around what the entrance is going to be like. And without saying anything, um, there is a lot of that idea of how can we launch people into this idea um, in, a, in a new way. Um, and I think there's going to be some really interesting ideas come through from that. And it is, again, why I think gaming isn't gaming. Um, well, I, look, I'm not a gamer myself, but I think I've actually been part of one, a character in one, some years back, uh, actually when I was going about my job. I don't know if people are aware, but underneath Parliament and under the Syria there are secret tunnels um, which contain secret command quarters which were used in World War II and may still be there and the government that's us don't want you to know about them. And um, this was many years ago, um, a, a, a chap came into the library and asked me for plans and you know, photographs of these tunnels and I had to confess ignorance, you know, I, I, I couldn't help him and I sort of realised after a while that this guy hadn't come into the library and was asking a librarian, you know, for information. He'd infiltrated the command headquarters and was interrogating the gatekeeper, <laughs> which was me, you know, and, and I was sort of part of his game. And I, I have to say that I have actually treated interrogating 1840 exactly the same way. Um, you know, and I, and I often, you know, game myself when I'm using sort of information systems. And I do think, you know, that um, we have to be, it has occurred to me, that someone may set up a game which uses our databases and our search um, 
the systems as, 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 a, as, the, as the software for a game, and they'll sort of set people to coming and using our um, software. Anyway, that was just an odd thought. That's a wonderful <laughs> story, John. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I just think that there is, um, I will, I want to see. <laughs> game design has been around for quite a while and there are some very solid ideas in there about um, you know, how to have interactions and things that aren't about technology or anything. And I think that's what you're kind of getting to is how can we apply that game design theory to, yeah. Yeah, Amy would like, so neither Adrian nor I are parents, but Amy is asking to respond and I would love to hear what she says and I do have something to say, but I think she's much better placed. I'm not speaking as a parent, but I was wondering actually when you talked about ancestry, yeah. um, about whether one of the things that we would collect around games is um, uh, brain imaging of people playing them because um, I think that's where you were getting out of ancestry, you were getting chemical payoff. Yeah. Um, that was keeping you there, that was going, no, I don't need a cup of tea, I don't need a week, I'm just going to do this next one, I'm just going to do it, this it was, next one. It, it, um, it, there are definitely things that they've learned from video games that are incorporated into Ancestry.com. It, yeah. It, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I think that's an aspect, and I think yeah. potentially um, if we get better and better in that field, um, we may actually legislate uh, in that area around how illegal it is to um, to design for um, clinical panel? I, I would like to respond to, to your question and your concerns. Um, and really, I, I'm not a parent, so I can't speak in that way. But I can, I guess, just relay what my mum did, because she was very concerned. And I think she handled it really well, which was, because we were obsessed with them. And um, they, as, as, as you saw, like, they were a lot blockier and more rubbish than, than the amazing, amazing technology that and all of the tr psychological tricks that, that folk have learned just to encourage people just to take one more turn or just spend, just, you know, another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. And so what she did was she's like, okay, you like games so much, learn how to make games. And so she made, she kind of not made us program, but that was the deal, was if we were gonna spend all this time um, using the computer for games, we also had to, um, we couldn't use it all for playing, we had to use it to learn about programming. Um, and she didn't know anything about programming, but um, that was just sort of the, the deal that we had. If we were going to be using the computer, we couldn't spend it all on, uh, on, on playing. We also had to be making something and doing something creative. And that's kind of in a funny way how I ended up doing what I do because I started just making little video games. Um, and she also did, I should say, she controlled the amount of time that we spent. So we weren't allowed to spend you know, entire days on the computer, we had to go outside, we had to play a sport, we had to do this other stuff that we didn't quite want to do, but collect Pokemon, <laughs> Poke but which I'm now grateful for. Like, I'm really glad that, that she um, set those boundaries. But that was the thing that we sort of, there was a compromise that was struck that, yeah, we could play pirates um, on Saturday afternoon, but we couldn't spend like the whole time doing that. We also had to like kind of learn about computers a little bit if we did and that actually put us off it at some signs and eventually I kind of like fell away from it for a while um, but yeah so just to that's a sort of a rambling answer but um, just to make sure that we like anything that we struck a balance in what we did. I was going to say something vaguely similar and it was around making and it wasn't necessarily around making games but but there's a lot of crossover between games and obviously building anything because a lot of games are around building and I think that's why Minecraft has had such a almost an easy run through because it's not just a fighting, it's about building and so much education stuff has come through from it. Um, but I do think that there is the, uh, you know, what is it that you do like about the games? How, can you do something that's kind of like it? So, you know, video work and things like that as well. Um, and again, I think it's probably the same kind of thing. It's finding what it is that's really enjoyable and just finding another way to do it. I'd like to say something as well quite specific to No Man's Sky. So, sorry, this is, I'm talking very specifically to this young man here. Um, and that I actually think that, um, have you, are you playing it on PS4 or P P PC? Yeah, it, uh, it unlocks tomorrow, right? So if, if he was playing, yeah. So you're expecting to play it over the, yeah. 
So I've been fo- like I've been watching some streams. I've been reading about it for for the folk who don't know what we're talking about. Um, it's extraordinary. It's been it's something that's been in development for about four years. There's been a lot of attention on it. It uses a technique called. Uh, in fact, if we go back to the elite. Um, so elite was remarkable because it was made in 1983. Um, by a fellow Ian Bell and another David Raymond. David Raymond. Um, this is really encouraging that you know this. <laughs> um, it was remarkable because it used techniques called procedural generation. So, so um, floppy disks were so tiny, you could, you could barely fit anything on them. And so instead what they did, and this was revolutionary, was that they actually, instead of saving everything as data, they instead wrote some rules that would generate the universe afresh, um, but in a deterministic way each time the game started. And so you played with millions of planets. In fact, they actually, there's, a, oh, no, that's, well, don't worry. I've got, <laughs> Elite is a, I was fascinated. I was, I was obsessed by Elite when I was <laughs> probably a little bit younger than, significantly younger, but um, <laughs> it's just because that was the time that I encountered it. Um, and so what it meant was that there were just these tens and tens of thousands of planets to explore. And No Man's Sky is almost like a modern realization of Elite, where it generates all these planets, but they don't look like what we just saw before. They are these completely, almost kind of photorealistic worlds with um, new animals and new uh, creatures and flora and fauna. Um, But what I was going to say, and just mute it, yeah. Um, and, and you shoot things. <laughs> um, but what is um, remarkable about it is, uh, can you search for No Man's Sky trailer maybe? Um, the, what I was going to say is actually that from the accounts that I've been reading of people playing it, there are many games which are made at the moment um, uh, which are all just use these psychological tricks in order to compel the person to keep playing. So it's all about collecting, like like collecting achievements and collecting little, um, uh, um, uh, just, you found this one? Here's the next one, here's the next one, here's the next one. And so this kind of compelling chain. What people are talking about with No Man's Sky is that because there's an infinite universe basically to explore, it suddenly relaxes the, um, the anxiety that many people play when they go into a game that they have to find everything because they can't possibly find everything. And I actually see it as being quite a healthy um, evolution in games in a funny way because of that, because it's like you aren't, because nobody knows what's out there, even the programmers, it's just kind of wandering about and, and discovering things. And I think something that's much more closely approximates true play than the kind of much more staged managed experience using all sorts of psychological tricks to jump from one to Everyone's just watching the screen. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> um, we do actually have to finish up, but I, I was, it didn't make me think of one thing is, is modding. Um, and modding has become such a big thing, particularly for PC gamers. And if you look at um, Grand Theft Auto, and what the gamers are making from Grand Th- on top of Grand Theft Auto is nothing like the original game, and in many ways, a lot better, a lot funnier. Um, and I wonder where this will go if you can't do that kind of thing, but if you can start to force the algorithms to build stuff, that might be really interesting. But um, we are over time already. Um, so I would like to, first of all, thank Chris, um, and thank all of you for coming and attending and staying over time and asking great questions. Um, and thank you all. Thank you.